everyone and welcome back to another episode of Globes Talks with Traders, where you can learn the ins and outs of crypto trading. I'm your host Sunlight and joining me today is Quant Trader Arbit. Watch on to find out more about all the different avenues that you can take within crypto trading and also how to control your emotions in this volatile market. Now, on to the interview. So hi Arbit, uh, how are you? Hey, I'm very good, thanks. What about you? I'm good, thank you. So, uh, would you like to tell us a bit about your background and how you got into crypto trading? Yeah, sure. Um, so, it started uh, almost no more than ten years ago at this point, almost eleven years ago. Uh, in 2011, I was just larking on on 4chan at the time, and this is something that randomly came up a few times, and I just, you know, was curious about what it was, and I started researching a little bit. And at the time, obviously, I was very young; I didn't know anything about uh, this space or about finance or anything uh, so it was more uh, like a you know uh, like an interesting concept um a fascinating concept uh, so i didn't think much of it uh it wasn't really um, anything so serious it was below a dollar at the, at the time so it's just sort of mining a little bit uh sort of setting up some some mining uh, just on my uh, desktop computer when I was not gaming and, and using it for other stuff. So it wasn't a very serious operation. I wasn't even running 24 seven. It was uh, kind of random. And I didn't even take very seriously the Bitcoin that I mined back then. I, I will regularly like wipe my hard drive when I needed some space. And oftentimes I think I do it in my wallet at least two or three times. Uh, I will say just, you know, there are just a couple of BTC on here. Who cares? It's like, it's like $2. I wouldn't even take time to back those up. Um, so yeah, and then over time, um, you know, I started uh, trading actively in 2013 on Mt. Gox at the time. Um, that's when I, I bought my first uh, small amount because when I started in 2011, I didn't even have a credit card or anything because I was, as I said, I was in high school, I was underage. So in 2013, I, I bought my first little amount. It was like, I don't know, like 50 or 100 bucks. Um, and then, uh, unfortunately, at the moment I was discovering uh, kind of active trading, so I was keeping my funds on Antigox. Um, so yeah, they're still there. Um, hopefully, <laughs> one day I'll get them back. <laughs> um, so after Mangox happened uh, in 2014, I, I kind of rage quit for a bit. I didn't, um, I didn't look at crypto for like a year or so. Then every once in a while, like every month or two, I will look back. Uh, prices and then over time i got back in, into it um and at the beginning of 2017 i started actively trading again um i moved to to kraken at the beginning and then i discovered bitmax which at the time was very hot um it was the cool thing of the moment so i traded there for the whole year and had a fantastic year and that kind of changed the trajectory of my you know it took me made me take this much more seriously obviously because i made some some very good uh money and it was actually very you know it was much much cooler space than it was in 2011 uh, even though there were a lot of money grabs and icos and, and shady stuff going on but it was so much more developed and it felt way more real and uh, you know it felt like something back in 2011 it felt like a kind of an obscure scammy thing that you don't really want to mess with too much because you know what is going to happen you know it felt shady and um and not like an industry yeah yep so uh you say now it's it's less shady um so what kind of other trends have you seen in the crypto sphere in within this decade that you've been trading so one thing that always comes around, uh, I guess, is um, macro trends in a way. So, uh, for example, in 2017, ICOs were, were the hot new thing. So uh, a few significant ones started happening, and then all of a sudden, everybody jumped on the bandwagon. So um, then it became basically the theme of that run, uh, kind of like DeFi uh, in this run. So I will say, the thing that's persisting the most is this kind of um, aggregation of, of, of trends. I don't know how to describe that. But basically, it's kind of like the, the moving clusters um, 
there is a new concept coming up and everybody tries to do that. Even if they have a project that might initially be set to do something slightly different, they try to um, get the exposure of that uh, macro trend that is happening. So I think that's the constant throughout the years. Absolutely. So um, how do you formulate your trading strategies? So, um, well, right now um, I'm doing mostly quantitative stuff. So there is a couple ways that I do that. The first way um, is intuitively. So uh, I will just uh, discover new venues, uh, new exchanges, and uh, just kind of look at the order book and uh, what's happening at prices and open a, a quite a few tabs on my browser and just look at prices at the same time um, and see if there is any inefficiency that I can spot by eye. Um, any, anything obvious. On some smaller venues, it's easy to even spot single players. So you can uh, almost see by eye what one bot is doing because you can kind of, you know, the order book is pretty thin and you can see, uh, you can identify people by their quantity and by their, you know, their distance from mid price and a couple of things. So um, sometimes it's by eye, some other times it's by data. So uh, I have a very extensive data collection infrastructure. So sometimes I will just uh, pull up some data and kind of play with it. Uh, so work on features, uh, work on visualization, uh, just see what I can find. And I guess kind of play around with signals, process them, uh, try to train some models and do some analysis on them, some feature importance and all of this and kind of see what, what sticks out and, and what seems to be more relevant and then kind of iterate on that. Um, some other times it's clients uh, because I also do uh, work for some clients on request. So sometimes people will come to me and say, hey, can you make me a bot that does, that does exactly this thing on this venue? And then I'll say, sure. And, and I go look at that venue spotted and that I didn't notice before. And while working on that project, I will learn uh, quite a few things. And then again, some other times, um, some ideas that maybe are not new, um, like, I don't know, like arbitrage, say a simple one, um, that they might not be viable on some venue. They suddenly become viable sometimes because, uh, for example, you might have a good relationship with a venue and maybe, you know, you, you're able to strike a contract with them or something. So you are able to get very good fees or some kind of rewards, or maybe you might be designated market making um, person for a project, for a DeFi project on some venues. You know, there are many, many ways um, with which a strategy can, can kind of come to you. Oh, amazing. So it sounds like there are so many, you know, avenues to trading that, you know, I personally have never thought about. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, you make it sound so easy, but of course it comes from, from years of experience, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that being said, though, do you have any tips for any newbie traders? For a newbie discretionary trader, I would say um, to try to get their hands dirty and try as many things out as possible. Never commit uh, your entire capital to something and always be aware that uh, for the first probably one or two years, if you're lucky, you're likely uh, going to lose money. So uh, never overcommit, even if an idea or a setup sounds fantastic and looks fantastic and you're very confident about it, uh, I would say never put all your eggs in one basket, uh, especially if you're not very experienced. Um, because, you know, staying in the game, um, even more so than, than losing that money, staying in the game gives you the opportunity to get better and actually have a shot at doing this at a higher level. Um, so definitely that. Um, and for quantitative traders, I will say, don't think too much about the money. Um, personally, I, I'm much more interested in the process. And uh, since it's a it's kind of a long, um, a, well, unless you're a very experienced developer, maybe working for some other project and then you have a lot of coding experience and, and you're very good at this. Uh, but if you are not uh, like a senior developer, it's going to be quite a long journey. You have to learn so much uh, because this space is extremely fragmented. Um, so it takes time, even if you are pretty good at it to um, you know, have enough experience and infrastructure to uh, kind of make this work. So uh, I would say think about the process more and don't be afraid to scrap what you already have because uh, you know your first uh, scratch that you're going to make of your system is not going to be your final 
anyway, no matter how good you try to do it if you don't have if you don't know what you're doing already. So I'll say that. And then for both of them, I'll say network as much as possible uh, because making friends and connections on, especially on Twitter right now, um, it's way much more alpha than any other alpha you can possibly have. It's better than any feature, it's better than any system, it's better than any setup or indicator or anything else. It's the number one thing. Absolutely. Thank you. So, um, you know, so what does a successful trading day look like for you in terms of volume? Well, it really depends on the strategy because um, I have some strategies that are uh, very, um, that have a very low turnover, so a, a very low volume compared to my balance. So, for example, if, you're, if I'm doing a startup and, um, you know, trading big baskets of stuff, I try to minimize my uh, execution to save on costs, save on slippage. So uh, I always try to net all my positions and always try to trade as, as, as little as possible. So that has a very low volume compared to the activity that I'm doing. And then some other strategies, uh, more high frequency stock and more, you know, high frequency market making, especially uh, has, you know, it's the opposite. You have a very, very high volume with a very small um, profit per, per, you know, per unit traded. Uh, so that could, could be like even 200 times my balance per day. It gets to crazy numbers, like millions and millions a day. Um, right. So can you tell us a little bit about, you know, the riskiest trade you've ever made that has paid off? Um, yeah. Um, so the best ones that I made were in 2017 when I was trading discretionary only. Um, they were the BTC forks. So in that year, uh, BTC forked a few times with Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin, I think Diamond, Bitcoin Gold. There are a few forks I don't even remember exactly. Um, I remember one was in August and one in November. And I played those two very well uh, because I noticed that, um, you know, it was pretty easy to spot. But uh, basically up until the time of the fork, price will, will go up for a few days. And then at the time of the fork, it will drop substantially. So I noticed this pattern on the first time that it happened and it made, obviously it made a lot of sense uh, intuitively speaking. So when it happened again, um, I tried to capitalize on it. So I went very hard on it, like 20 X leverage uh, long. And then one second before the fourth, just shorten the top. Um, and that was the best discretionary move that I made. I think I, I 30 X my account in a couple of instances. Uh, that was wow. the best wins that I ever made. Another one, another pretty good one was in October 2020. BTC was trading at like 11K right before the, the run up to 60. Um, at that moment, I, I was not sure in which direction it was going to go because uh, it had dipped extremely hard in March and it never dipped again. Uh, so, you know, I wasn't 100% sure it was going to go up. Um, so I played on volatility. So I, I did a huge uh, long on, on volatility on FTX move contracts. And that was a very good play as well. Probably the cleanest. Okay. I think I didn't lose by even one tick. I, I caught the perfect bottom, closed the perfect top. That was the perfect uh, play. Wow. Amazing. So um, do you know what? So conversely, what was the riskiest trade you made that didn't pay off? And what kind of lessons did you learn? Um, so earlier, uh, I think in 2018, during the, the beer run, um, there was one altcoin that I was accumulating, um, accumulated for a few months. And then in the summer, I was on vacation. I wasn't really paying too much attention. Um, it pumped, it did like 10x. And I noticed like two days afterwards because I, you know, I didn't have notifications on or anything. Um, so when I noticed it had already dipped another 50% from the top. And uh, stupidly, I decided not to sell and wait for another uh, pump. And that was a very bad decision because I, I learned that having free capital to move around and, and to occupy doing other things, it's sometimes more important than catching a little better of an exit. Um, and yeah, that was uh, 2018 for me was um, the year in which I kind of decided to make the transition from discretionary to quantitative. The trading because I noticed that um, you know doing this discretionarily um, full time is actually extremely heavy on your on your mind uh, primarily, and uh, it affects 
uh, your, you know, your, your lifestyle a lot. And then the way you feel affects your PNL a lot. So sometimes you have a lot of volatility, you don't sleep well, you're always on your phone and then, you know, you get stressed and you tend to risk more or to make irrational decisions. Like, you know, you're too tired. You just close the position because you can't just uh, monitor it because you're too, too stressed. So you, you lose on opportunities. It's just not very good statistically speaking. And, and I didn't enjoy doing that at all. Uh, after some months of that, or, you know, the whole 2017, I was very, I was very tired. So I, I wanted to find a different approach um, that was more, you know, easy to live with and more reliable and that I could enjoy more. So what I'm doing now, it's better because I can focus my energies more on code than on PNL. Uh, so it's kind of a proxy thing, uh, which just makes me live a little bit better. Okay, so, um, you know, apart from becoming uh, a quad trader, <laughs> is there any way that um, you can kind of control your emotions in this kind of volatile market that is crypto? Uh, I will say, uh, first of all, uh, you know, meditate and try to have as healthy lifestyle, lifestyle as possible. So, you know, have a good sleeping schedule and uh, try to set some hours if possible. So, and I know it's it's almost impossible because it's volatile. I kind of run on times very often, uh, but, you know, try to uh, maybe set alerts on TradingView for price moves and then try to get as much uh, free time as possible when nothing, is, nothing major is happening. Um, always write down uh, as much stuff as possible um, about your entries, your exits, and why you're taking trades or not. Try to make yourself accountable because then it helps you when... Uh, you're stressed and you don't know how to make a decision, uh, you know, taking a look at a journal where, where you brought down all the reasons why you do things or don't do things helps you um, not take irrational decisions too much uh, or become a contrader. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. So do you know what? It's, it's kind of like you're saying also quantify your feelings as well. Yeah, as much as you can, I will say yeah. so, yeah. Absolutely. Nice. Thank you. So um, do you prefer trading in a bull or bear market? Uh, in a discretionary way, I think I prefer bear because I feel like it's more rational. Sometimes in bull markets, you kind of, sometimes the, the most, uh, I don't want to say, um, wait, let me find the right word. Um, mm -hmm. The most irrational players sometimes win the biggest. Uh, like you get in a trade and you you get out of the trade at a sensible uh, level or target, and then it overshoots like three x that. Uh, so I think in bull markets sometimes uh, bad behaviors are rewarded. Um, so it's it's better if you like uh, try to be rational. Sometimes I feel myself I, I feel like um, for myself it's better to trade in bear markets, but then for quantity quantitative stuff. I prefer bull markets because there's more volatility, more volume, more uh, people who, who go take her instead of make her um, as a ratio. So it's easier to, you know, just do more volume and, and be more active and have better workouts and stuff. Amazing. Thank you. Um, so looking forward to the rest of the year, what are your goals? So right now I'm in the process of completing my new uh, frequency market making infrastructure. Um, so my goal is going to be uh, scaling that as much as possible and, you know, getting better at that. Uh, it's been kind of my last uh, milestone in terms of quantitative work. I started with much slower uh, strategies, much, um, you know, less performance kind of systems. And then now I'm at the point where I'm making a very high performance C++ uh, I frequency market making systems, um, a lot of machine learning and a lot of you know fancy stuff. So um, this is my my goal for 2022, and it's been an, an incredible journey. And uh, before, uh, like 10 minutes ago, uh, you were saying um, you know what was my what memorable kind of uh, milestone, and uh, I think in my case they're they're not about money or good trades. Uh, they're more about uh, being able to do things that I thought were impossible for me or 
that I thought were, uh, you know, maybe that I will take years to get there and then I'm able to accomplish them and I'm able to sometimes overshoot them. And so I think in my, in my mind, in my memories, all the best moments are related to things that I, I thought were, were impossible regarding my quantitative, quantitative programming journey rather than just trade. Oh, so it's nice to hear, you know, you're trading not because of the money, but just to prove to yourself that you can do something. Yeah, it's kind of like a game, you know. <laughs> of course, the money, the money is, is is nice, but it doesn't really motivate me. I, I'm not really, I don't, I don't really care much. Like, as long as I have, of course, enough to be comfortable, but it, it doesn't really move me. Absolutely. So can I ask why trading? <laughs> if money is not a motivation for you, <laughs> apart from, you That's know, the question. like the game gamification of life, I guess. That's a very good question. Um, <laughs> I guess I kind of fell into it. I guess it's nice because it's a type of business in which you can scale to really to get to get really big without actually um you know having to commit to something physical like you know opening a, a shop or having employees or having uh, an actual physical presence anywhere um without having to show yourself too much like you know show business or or other businesses so it's nice because I, I can be nerdy and stay in my room and at the same time scale business like crazy, you know, it's kind of a comfortable spot to be. And it's very fun um, because it's extremely challenging. I find um, when I started this journey, I kind of rediscovered my passion for science as a whole, for math, for uh, a ton of stuff that I, I kind of put aside after finishing my studies. And I thought I would never really use it too much. Um, and then, you know, I, I found myself, uh, being passionate about it again and, uh, you know, looking at videos and reading books in my free time about it, you know, so I don't think it's going to be my end game. I don't envision myself uh, doing this for the next 40 years or anything. It's just a nice step in my, in my life and I'm enjoying it as much as possible. And it's probably going to lead me to something else, uh, as good as this or, or better in the future. Absolutely enjoying the wave right now. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank you so much for watching this episode. If you enjoyed the content, don't forget to give us a like, comment, and subscribe. I'm your host, Sunlight. Thank you, Arbit, and I'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.